know me. I'm Michael Oliger. Um, I'm a radiologist, um, abdominal imager. Um, I'm a sometimes hyperpolarized carbon-13 researcher. I've been hanging around um, Mission Bay with uh, learning about this stuff for, I guess, almost since uh, for about nine or ten years now. And I think some of it is starting to sink in finally. Um, mainly, mainly I'm here because I like hanging out with cool people, but I, so I decided to learn a little bit about hyperpolarized carbon-13 in the liver. And so, because I come at this from an abdominal radiologist, as an abdominal radiologist, um, I, I, I think the liver presents um, interesting challenges for imaging. And so, a, lot of what I'll, a little bit of what I'll talk about is the liver gets tumors, and those tumors in hyperpolarized carbon largely look a lot like the tumors you'll see anywhere else. And so, you've learned that, um, as Kevin Kashari likes to say, tumors make lactate, and tumors make lactate in the liver too. And so I won't spend that much time talking about the things that are the same in the liver as everywhere else. Um, I'll, I'll concentrate a little bit, as, as what Peter Larson said, is why the liver is more interesting than any other organ, um, including the heart. And so I'm gonna focus on the things that are unique to the liver. And, that's, and, and, and that'll be, you know, a spoiler alert, That'll be because that'll be just like the heart is because the liver not only does it get tumors and not only do those tumors make lactate, but the the liver is really responsible for a lot of the metabolism, um, global metabolism that occurs in the body, and for a metabolic imaging probe that or metabolic imaging technique like hyperpolarized carbon thirteen that's really important. Okay, excellent. Um, this uh, so, some and so I, I, I this is a. As a doctor, I always have to say what, what I have to disclose, and I have no real financial disclosures with respect to this talk. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about liver anatomy. Where's the liver and, 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 and what it does? Um, I'm gonna talk about the two different things, and the talk is sort of divided into two halves. The first is about liver, actually first I'm gonna talk about liver tumors, and again, it's gonna be a lot of probably what you've seen before about tumors and other organs and other preclinical stuff. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we call diffuse liver disease or just how we look at the metabolism of the rest of the liver, just like Peter talked about how you look at the metabolism of the heart and why we look at the metabolism of the liver and why that might be interesting. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about blood flow in the liver because one of the things that makes liver unique is its blood flow because it, it is supplied differently you know, than most other organs and that has important physiologic and metabolic and imaging consequences. And then I'm going to talk, after I talk about this, I'm going to focus a little bit more about different probes and different approaches we use to diffuse liver disease. And obviously in the short talk, I sort of designed this to be 20 minutes. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through every single probe that's been used and every single technique that's been used, but I'm hoping to sort of give you an idea of what are the unmet challenges and also, you know, why, again, liver is, is more challenging or less challenging than other organs. So first, where is the liver? And this is important. So um, as uh, many of you know, even if uh, the non-radiologists, is that when we display images, and so this is sort of a whole body MR image, we sort of reverse them. And so the right side of the patient or person is going to be over here, and the left side is going to be over here. And that, that tumor in the chest is called the heart. And then we have the blood vessels down here, and we have two legs. We have a brain. I don't not interested in the brain. And, and, and these big black spaces are the lungs, and sort of in between all of those is the liver, which is sitting over here on the right side and it extends over to the left. And then if we draw this in color, um, this is the liver, and it basically sits, it's, it's, it's a digestive organ and it's a metabolic organ, so it's really connected to the stomach and the rest of the other blood supply. And so basically, one thing that's gonna become really important is how, what, what the inputs and outputs of the liver are. And so, the, sorry, the red things are arteries. So this is the aorta, which is the main artery coming from your heart. And that gives off this vessel here, which is called the hepatic artery, the one that goes to the liver. And that actually supplies a good bit of the liver. And what's missing here, and we're gonna talk about that later, is actually the portal vein, which is a whole nother vessel, which drains all of your bowel. And then the output of the liver, is two outputs. One actually goes up here. This is the inferior vena cava, and it's gonna be living right there. The inferior vena cava goes right into the heart, which is right there. So the output drains right into the heart. The heart's right here. And the other output, and this happens a lot slower, is actually the bile, the biliary system. So this is the gallbladder. So a lot of fatty things are actually excreted into the biliary tree and actually stored into the gallbladder. That's what all this green stuff is. Now, 
for the purposes of hyperpolarized carbon-13, because it happens so quickly, the sort of biliary output is less important because this takes minutes to happen, and sometimes 20, 30 minutes to happen, whereas, you know, obviously the C13 stuff happens in a one to two minutes. So we're going to talk about two stories, as I talked about before. A lot of this data, so actually at UCSF, we've, 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 you know, in terms of published data, we probably have more experience in the liver than a lot of other sites. And so a lot of things I'm going to show you is, is the work of one of the previous PhD students, um, Dr. Ju, who worked, um, worked with Dan Wigner on. And so this is an example of a tumor. And really, this illustrates how we're going to divide the talk. Um, the first is we're going to talk a little bit about what happens in tumors. And this is a, um, a I, think, I believe this is a uh, endometrial carcinoma metastatic to the liver. And so this is, you can see it's kind of dark and it has metabolism and it has a good bit of lactate, it's a good bit of pyruvate, doesn't have a whole lot of alanine. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about what the rest of the liver does. And you see one of the distinguishing characteristics of the rest of the liver is it's got a good bit of alanine. Um, so liver, first of all, is a primary site of tumors. It's, it's a, it, the main two tumors that occur in the liver is hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma is the, basically the the ones that are primary origin is the liver cells. Cholangiocarcinoma is where the primary site of origin is the bile cells, so those ones that we looked at before. Um, hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common primary liver tumor. It almost always happens when people are alcoholics or people have cirrhosis. Um, very rarely happens in just normal healthy people who don't have any other liver disease. Cholangiocarcinoma is relatively uncommon in the United States. It happens in chronic inflammatory diseases, but there are places in Southeast Asia um, where it's endemic, such as, um, oh, sorry, such as in, in, in Thailand, where actually cholangiocarcinoma is actually one of the more common tumors you'll see, and that's because it's related to sort of chronic infections by different parasites and leads to chronic inflammations. The other thing which is missing from this slide is metastases. Metastases are extremely uncommon in the liver. Um, metastases are most common in almost every organ except for the brain. Um, may even be most common in the brain. I think it is also most common in the brain. And so the reason why it's very common in the liver is because the liver drains the entire bowel. So metastases can come from the bowel and metastases can come from the other organs. The other thing we're gonna talk about later is that liver is a crucial metabolic organ. And the two main things it does is, one is actually not just drug metabolism, but metabolism of anything particularly toxins. And so if you take it, but, but particularly if you take a drug or if you, you know, anything is ingested in the body, it's actually going to get metabolized by the liver. And the other is in terms of, you know, basically glucose homeostasis. So in things like diabetes, which, which I'm interested in, um, you know, the liver plays a central role in gluconeogenesis, basically the storage of glucose and the release of glucose back into the bloodstream. And, and those are things that we're going to be able to see with um, C13. And so this is an example of a C13 acquisition in a patient, and this is actually where we put our little surface coil here, and this is an example of two spectra. We'll see. Excellent. Um, so basically, oh my god, they came out dark. Okay, but the, um, so I'll talk about tumors a little bit, because again, I, I think tumors in the liver, although they're fascinating, they behave a lot like tumors there other places, um, but with some differences. So this is one of the most er the earliest studies back when hyperpolarized carbon was sort of in its infancy, um, or at least the, the in vivo application. So this is in a rat model of hepatocellular carcinoma. And one thing about hepatocellular carcinoma is animal models are really weird. So there's, there, in the liver, there, there's not great animal models of hepatocellular carcinoma. You, there are things that look like hepatocellular carcinoma, but human liver cancer is human liver cancer. But in any case, this is like basically an orthotopic model of HCC. And what they observed, which is what we observe in a lot of tumors, is that in the tumor, the pyruvate is basically the same, the lactate is elevated. One interesting thing that happens in tumors, um, some tumors and not in other tumors, and, and I don't think anyone really understands the significance in general of alanine. So we see alanine in many liver processes, both metabolic liver processes as well as cancer. And the question is, what, what is the significance of this elevated alanine? So in this particular tumor model, alanine was very elevated. But again, um, what, what that means um, beyond the fact that, you know, in terms of aggressiveness, in terms of other things, is, is, is you know, really to be known. And, and another one intriguing, you know, story about alanine and just sort of as a sidetrack, Again, this is where liver is a little different than humans, and, and this doesn't have a citation, but this is from Simon Hu, who used to, again, work here, 
And this was a really nice paper that he did in, in a transgenic model of a liver tumor, which actually had a transgenic oncogene. And what he showed was actually that if you look at pyruvate lactate and alanine in this particular model, is that if you looked at areas of the liver that basically if you go from normal liver and then you go to an area of tumor, um, the lactate goes up, which is sort of what you expect, right? Tumors make lactate. But what's interesting is that if you, there's sort of a, sort of a sort of vaguely defined sort of precancerous lesion in this particularly transgenic model. Um, and in that pre, precancerous lesion, the alanine actually goes up. Um, again, the, the sort of significance of this and, and, and how generalizable this is, um, I don't think people really know yet, um, but um, I think it, it, it's fascinating and it's, it's basically another area of metabolism that you see in the liver. And we'll come back to alanine a little bit later. Um, I, I, you know, and so in terms of humans, so the idea is that when, you know, why are we interested, and again, this is, this is just my perspective, why, why are we interested in hyperpolarized carbon-13 in general to look at cancer in particular? Because cancer, as opposed to metabolic liver disease, has a bunch of other methods to look at it, and the main one being fdg -PAT. Um, And also, you know, conventional imaging works well, and there's like a million other ways people look at cancer, because the NCI has a lot of money. So the question is, is why is C13 interesting? Is because you know, again, cancer is in some ways a metabolic disease and there are specific important metabolic pathways. And those metabolic pathways are targeted and one of the ones that gets targeted, and this is just an example because, you know, for, because this is a clinical study that's sort of ongoing here, is looking at the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway, which is basically how growth factors basically go and then they basically, you know, regulate different things in, in the um, cell. And then why, alterations in this pathway make cancer. Um, you know, there's various reasons and that's a much more complex story. Um, the other interesting thing, which is also a more complex story than it sounds, is that even though this pathway is over here and our good friends, pyruvate, lactate, glycolysis and everything are over there, basically separate, they have sort of a connect, enough of a connection that changes in this pathway actually make changes over here. So you can actually see more immediate responses to this. And so this is, you know, again, this is a study that's ongoing, but the idea uh, behind this, and, and, you know, this is an incomplete story, is to see if, you know, you can make changes to this part and then using this as a readout, know that this is happening. And so this was one example from now Dr. Zhu um, looking at this where, where we had a, a a uh, metastasis within the, the liver, and we had a pre and post therapy. This is with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, um, and actually could see the lactate go down um, and uh, compared to the pyruvate. Okay, um, the, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, how much. So this is a, a probably about 30, 40 percent chance of a decrease in lactate. Of course, the noise floor is pretty high here, but you know, definitely goes down. And so again, what 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 the what the useful use use of this, um, you know, we still have to see, but you know, it is those treatment responses and looking at the metabolism of tumors where I think C13 has a unique role to play, and and that's you know, not just us, but but a whole whole host of people are looking into. So um, th that was the main thing I wanted to say about tumors, um, you know, and there's a whole bunch else to say about tumors. But one thing I want to comment on is one of the challenges of looking at the liver and why it you know, may not be different than everything else is, as we said, the liver has two different blood supplies. So this is the aorta and hepatic artery. So this is an arterial supply. But there's also the portal vein. And it's called a vein, even though it supplies the liver, is because it drains the bowel and it drains the spleen. So basically, you're also getting blood from here. And so these balance of these two things are, of course, going to affect what you see in um, you know, anything, hyperpolarized carbon-13 or other things. And then just in terms of how the liver works, so this is what we're trying to see on a microscopic level. So we basically go from the liver down to here, which is basically a sinusoid. And so this is actually the micro, this is the smallest repeatable element of the liver. So this big liver is basically a repetition of millions and millions and millions of these like hexagonal structures. And basically, this is the microstructure, okay? And then every one of these microstructures has something in the middle, and that's actually, um, uh, sorry, 
So I always get, so whether, which one you put in the middle is always different, right? So you have a hepatic artery and you have a portal vein out here and that in the middle, you're going to have a hepatic vein. And then you also have a, a tiny little bile duct. And all of these will basically flow together, but everything happens on this small microscopic level and sort of builds up from there. But what's the practical influence from what we see? It's actually got a huge practical influence. So the normal blood actually gets about one, so this is, you know, if you're ever on Jeopardy, and they ask you what fraction of the liver is supplied by the hepatic artery and what fraction is supplied by the portal vein, you'll be like, yes, I got that one. You'll be like, what is 33%? And they have to say which one it is. So, um, but about a third of the liver blood supply, just in normal everyday state, is supplied by the hepatic artery, and about 67% comes from the bowel, which is basically rest. But the thing about that is once you have tumors or once you have other things, this balance is actually going to change, right? And so, for instance, uh, oh, I forgot to draw the bowel. That's the bowel coming in. Cool. And that's the hepatic vein going out. And that's, that's that little... Um, microstructure that we were talking about is everything draining into each other. So what does that look like on imaging? So this is just regular contrast enhanced MR. And so you actually, we generally image the liver in two different phases. And we image the liver pretty early where the blood supply is basically dominated by the hepatic artery. And this is the portal vein. It's just like a little kind of faint thing. And then we image it later where everything else is filled in and we mostly have the portal vein is completely filled in and this is the portal vein is face, okay? And because tumors in particular behave differently between the, um, the rest of the liver on these arterial and portal venous faces, what we get to see is so, although the liver is one third supplied by the arteries and the, the, the rest of the liver and, and two thirds supplied by the portal vein, by distinction, tumors are actually preferentially supplied by the artery. So basically what we can see here, and this is a hallmark of hepatocellular carcinoma, is on this arterial phase, when we mostly have it in the artery, you see the tumor and it's really bright. And on the later um, contrast images, because the rest of the liver has been allowed to be perfused by the portal vein, the liver actually, sorry, the tumor actually looks relatively dark. And so this is sort of a washout appearance. So tumors not only have change in metabolism, but they also have changes in blood flow. And this is actually what we use in clinically all the time. And um, it's an open question, actually, how important this is um, in human imaging. Um, this is something just in animal models is very difficult to see because actually in animal models, the difference between the arterial and portal venous is about three seconds. So you, these stages just happen together. But in humans, the difference is probably, you know, if you look at peak enhancement, the difference is about a minute or 45 seconds. So they're, they're pretty. And I can show you, we can see this in humans. So, Sorry, can you tell us what is that 45 seconds for minute? So it, it's a little complicated, but if you inject a, a bolus and you look at the peak of where that bolus is, and then you keep measuring like a dynamic contrast enhancement, and you look where the peak bolus happens due to the artery and the peak bolus happens due to the vein, then those, that's relative timing. So about 45 seconds, you, you, you're the, the perfusion of the liver is dominated by the artery. That's like most of the, have you calculated, where is the blood coming from? It'll probably be like, you know, a certain percentage, I don't know what it is, 80% from the artery, 20% from the vein. When you, about a minute and a half or a minute later, then, which is long on the hyperpolarized time scale, you have about, you know, probably the reverse. You have the normal supply, 70% from the, 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 the portal vein and 30% from the artery. And that's that timing. Whereas the timing for, in, in the rodents, it's just these happen, they just overlap almost completely. I, I've never been able to see, do a DC experiment if not high enough temporal resolution to really distinguish them in a, in a rat or a mouse. Other people probably have, but you have to be really fast. Anyway, so just to, to, to keep going, so we get to the exciting um, demonstration part of it. So this was an example, in, in, in when we did normal liver, um, yeah, this is uh, what someone who may or may not be in this room speaking right now. But um, so this was an example where we just took some surface coils, and, and, you know, and Jeremy and Shin Yu did this. Um, and, um, and we just looked at the, what went into like the normal liver. And obviously we have some shading because the coils are over here. Um, and, but you can get pyruvate lactate and alanine signal. This is from the EPI experiment. Um, and what I thought was neat from this study, and um, you just ignore this stuff because you don't have much coil sensitivity here and, and you sort of have some cardiac contamination. But if you look at the liver dynamically, you can actually see that perfusion and you can actually see those different phases. And so if you look at like where the aorta is, it's here. And if you look at where the IVC, that's the thing that's draining out of the liver. 
And then you actually see where the portal vein is, is right there with some partial voluming, and then that's normal liver. So actually you can tell sort of an arterial input, you can tell a venous input, and these differences in supply actually matter on the hyperpolarized time scale, which is actually kind of cool. Um, now, uh, the, you know, that, that's sort of what I want to say about humans for now is, you know, because I think we're, we're just starting those and, 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 and we're going to be doing more and more in the next uh, little bit. And, and really, I think for humans, we want to, you know, we want to, first of all, as you can see here, we don't, we don't really have complete coverage yet. So we still need better coils and other things for humans. Um, but I think that question of injection timing and what the input function is actually very important. And then um, we didn't talk so much about breathing motion, but this is a huge problem doing hyperpolarized carbon um, because you know patients don't want to hold their breath. 60 seconds is, is long and a short period of time unless you're trying to hold your breath. Okay, so what I want to talk about the last few minutes, maybe the last, last 10 minutes, is actually what the rest of the liver is doing. Okay, so what we're really good at um, in liver imaging, irrespective of hyperpolarized carbon, is we're look, good at like seeing the liver, right? You get these really beautiful images. Um, we can see how big the liver is. So in pathology, sometimes the liver gets bigger, sometimes it gets smaller. There, there are different reasons for that. They get cancer. We talked about that already. Um, but what we don't see is, is, again, that whole microstructure, all of these little cells in that microstructure, they're little factories, and they're all doing stuff that's really important, and we want to be able to see that. And some of the things it does, just a couple things. One is there, there is something called, a, 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 there's, there, there's basically energy regulation and glucose metabolism. So basically circulating lactate and, sorry, circulating glucose is taken in, um, depending on how much insulin you have, and it's made into glycogen. The other thing that it does, which people don't think a lot about, is a lot of your energy is actually stored in muscle in the form of either um, in the form of, 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 of amino acids. And so that circulation of the muscle between the amino acids and here actually happens there too. And the other thing it does is, of course, detoxification, and that, that's the urea cycle and other things like that. And so um, and that's, we, we want to see, you know, normally we look at the liver, which is liver disease, and then we have some fibrosis, which becomes end-stage liver disease, but really, and I, I, this is like, there was more an animation here, but it's really this area here, which is the unmet need, it's sort of hidden under everything else, but I think those alterations in metabolism and liver injury is where hyperpolarized carbon has a big role, and we have a lot of markers, again, of diffuse liver disease, looking at liver fat, liver iron and liver fibrosis, but we, 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 we really can't see the metabolism. And so that's where we're targeting. And so just some examples, and, and these again are biased by things that you know, I've done or been involved in, but you know, um, the, the, the fact is, is that for instance, if you give a toxin, which is carbon tetrachloride to the liver and you get this damage, you don't have to be a pathologist to know that's abnormal, you actually get elevated lactate and oh my gosh, alanine came back. The alanine production actually goes up too. Um, and actually, if you let this as a mouse, mouse liver regenerates, it'll actually go back to normal. That's actually kind of interesting. Um, and so again, you, you, this is a direct effect of the necrosis of the liver. Why that happens, a bunch of people have shown this happens. Why you get lactate in this situation, I don't think people really know. Um, I'm interested in fatty liver disease, and that's, that's where this is sort of a chronic condition related to diabetes, and is going to be a very important cause of liver transplantation now that they've cured hepatitis C. And so this is, but the thing is, is a lot of people with fatty liver disease, not many people progress to this bad state of hepatitis and you want to know who's going from there to there and how it happens. And so a couple ways you can look at it. One way is looking at oxidative stress. And so this was done by David Wilson and Kevin Kashari where they were looking at DHA and you can see changes in the metabolism from DHA to vitamin C, um, depending on whether the patient, the mouse, is undergoing this mouse model of fatty liver disease, and hopefully patients someday. Um, and then again, this is the last one I wanna show, is says when you look at diabetes, so Cornelius von Morsey, who used to be here, um, did this experiment where you're looking at different rat models of obesity, and, and Joe is actually starting to take over this work. And you can see when you take these obese rats, um, models of type one and type two diabetes, you get actually changes in um, lactate and alanine. And the part that I don't have time to go into, but there's actually a divergent response. So whether you have the model of type one or type two is actually the alanine behaves differently. It's again, that mysterious alanine, which I don't, again, I'm not smart enough to understand and maybe there's someone else who's smarter, but it, it keeps showing up. 
so anyway, I, you know, in this, this whirlwind tour, um, a, a little, I went over my time of, of 20 minutes. It's like 25 minutes. Apologize. But, you know, I think um, in the liver, we talked about tumors. And then we also talked about, you know, cellular metabolism. And what is the value added of hyperpolarized carbon in general, both for tumors and cellular metabolism? I mean, for just global metabolism is, is being able to look at those metabolic pathways. So for tumor, you've got the idea of treatment response. And then for what we call diffuse liver disease, like diabetes and other metabolic liver disease, we're actually looking at what those little hepatocyte factories are doing. And, and I think, you know, which is, which is why I'm here and, and been hanging around here for the past few years. Um, I, I think that hyperpolarized carbon is going to have a big role in this. Um, and that this says the same thing. <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, thank you for your attention. This was a lot of fun. Um, for the people I haven't met, come say hi sometime. The people I have met, hi, it's good to see you again. All right.